Hi, and welcome to the first ever community call of the Light Leaders membership group. Thank you so much, Doug Graham, for being our first special guest. And thank you so much, Brendan, Zizi, Dylan, and Zoe for joining the group. So it's a Q&A. The people who are part of the group, I think many of you have watched the podcast already and have followed you quite a bit, Doug. So we can go into a little bit more advanced uh, questions. How we do is we record the whole and the first 40 minutes we put them on youtube and keep the last 20 minutes for if we want more private conversations so yeah thank you so much doug i'll start with a very quick um intro let's say just from my perspective because i've been like many of us here on the raw food fruit and journey you've uh, you've written this book the 80 10 10 diet which i've listened to and it's been amazing as a foundation for my journey and then in in the realm also of the of this nutrition there are different um, different paths yours is a lot of fruits and also quite big quantities which is something other people in the field um yeah debate more anyway that that's for like a, a quick intro i know you also like really fit you exercise a lot, do a lot of strength training, and you've also trained a lot of athletes. So that's also an angle, the quantities we eat, the fruits, and being an athlete on those uh, on those fruits. So now I'll leave it up to the conversations. So if uh, if you want to say something to start with, Duke, I'll invite you for that, and then we can go on for the questions. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I've been following this raw journey now for coming up to 45 years and have seen a lot of different approaches tried. Some people say I eat a lot of fruit. I think I eat the an average amount of fruit for a human being and that most people just don't eat much fruit. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not a right or wrong thing. Uh, some people say I use a lot of calories or a lot of volume and again, uh, I'm helping world-class performers do their best. I'm helping sick people and people who have been considered unhelpable, unhealable, you know, and helping them turn their life around. Uh, and what I've found is that people who don't eat enough end up either binging a little bit down the line or they find their program is unsustainable completely because they lose so much weight. Now, a little bit of weight loss is generally, for a lot of people, that's a good idea. But there's people who don't wish to lose, and I understand that as well. Uh, if you don't eat enough, you will lose weight. I mean, that's the whole basis for weight loss. Uh, when people try to convince you that there's some other basis for weight loss, I <clears throat> I think they're hitting you, really. If you don't eat enough, you lose weight. How do you lose weight? Don't eat enough. If you want a sustainable program, you've got to eat enough. And I, I could eat an apple and a cucumber on some given Wednesday, but I'm not going to tell you that I could do that for 365 days in a row just an apple and a cucumber. Calorie needs basically equate <clears throat> with fuel needs. And for people who carry more muscle, fuel needs are greater. For people who are more active, fuel needs are greater. It's just like if you drive your car more or have a bigger car, a heavier car, a gas guzzling motor or a very efficient motor. Now, I understand full well that people who are inactive that don't carry much muscle mass don't need anywhere near as much food. No question. The question that does arrive, however, is can they possibly be well nourished if they're not eating much food? Let's say, let's say a really inactive, lightweight person 
eats 1500 calories a day and and a fairly active still trim athlete guy is eating 4500 calories a day or triple the amount of calories he's also taking in triple the protein triple the calcium triple the zinc triple the iron triple omegas triple essential fatty acids triple essential protein or essential amino acids nutrient intake triples simply by eating more does the digestive load become a little bit more yeah for sure but i have a strong feeling more than a feeling that it's basically impossible to be well nourished on a sedentary lifestyle so the people who choose to be inactive and say, well, I don't need to eat as much because I'm inactive. They're right in terms of weight management, but they're wrong in terms of nutrition. And they're wrong in terms of health because you can't be a healthy person who's inactive. Those two don't go together. So that's an opening. I don't know if you guys have questions or, I mean, you all look fit and trim and athletic. It's kind of cool. Yes. Yeah, it's easy. Is it a- yeah, th- thanks. Uh, about the calories uh, that uh, you've talked about, do you think that after time you can decrease calories intake and you have the same result? I think, I mean, the, the weight after time, after one, two, three years, because I think my experience is that I, li- I eat Every year, less, less, less. Is it? Uh, but it's also seen on my uh, on my body. So I've never been as lean as I uh, as I am today. So you're thinner now. Yeah, I'm a little bit thinner. Yeah, so you're but eating I... less and you're getting thinner. Yeah, and, but... and there's no mystery there. That's what I just said. You eat less, yeah. you will get thinner. Now that might work well for your for your particular chosen activity you might want to be lighter you might be a cardio guy and and want to get really light uh, but if you compete That's in a weight me. class let's say you compete in a weight class and and the class was 74 kilos and now you're down to 68 kilos um you know you're at the bottom of your weight class and you're still trying to compete with guys that are have six kilos on you it's not going to go well you know it's not going to work to your advantage the question is, can you eat less? And 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 the interesting thing is, to a small degree, there's some truth there. But really, mostly, no. I'm going to say no. But let me answer both sides of that. The truth. The healthier you get, the higher the quality of the foods you choose the more digestible they become and the better your digestive processes work, the more efficient and effective you are at gathering nutrients, including calories, from the food you eat. All of this contributes to what's called a reduced digestive load. So instead of using a thousand calories a day to digest your food, you could reduce your digestive load down to 800 calories or 600 calories to process the very same number of calories. That four to 600 or that two to 400 calories saved can translate into fewer calories eaten, or it could translate into more calories available for activity or weight management, whether you wish to go up or down. So it depends how you want to use it, but I don't see it as a continuing trend where you're going to use less and less and less until you finally you're using no fuel at all. That's not the direction. Nor, I don't believe, is it a goal to get lighter and lighter and lighter until you weigh nothing at all. Uh, 
the amount of body fat you choose to carry and the amount of muscle you choose to carry is totally choice. It's preference. You get to pick, you get to pick, Zoe, exactly what you want to look like five years from now, what image you wish to convey to others. If you want people to look and say, oh, he's a cardio guy. Oh, he's a weightlifter. Oh, she moves like a yogini. Oh, maybe they're a springboard divers or a gymnast. I can't tell. Oh, that look, look, big right arm, small left arm. That's a tennis player. We we can look at people and tell what they do by their chosen activities. <laughs> we can tell. And but it takes time to develop physique. Physique physique development posture development, movement pattern development. These are, these things take some time and effort. We're talking about what, we're not talking about tomorrow's workout. We're talking about, wow, what's this going to look like in three years, five years, 10 years? When you're 10 years from now, do you want to be stronger or weaker than you are right now? If you want to be stronger 10 years from now, you better be including strength training now. If you want to have a better mile time or a better kilometer time, like five years from now than you do now, you better be running some sprints and doing some strength training along with all your... So we can pick and choose all of that. But it's still, if you open up a standard sports physiology book, it's going to tell you it takes X number of calories for a person of a certain weight to move from A to B, a kilometer apart. How many calories does it take to move 70 kilos one, mo one kilometer? You know, and that number of calories, that amount of effort is already a physical known. And that's not going to change just because you start eating mangoes instead of Big Macs. The number, so your effort is a predetermined number of calories. There are places you can affect this whole thing. For instance, when people fast, post fast, their digestive efficiency is unbelievably good. They can, they can get calories out of everything. They're really good. They digest their food and pull everything that's in the food out of the food into the body. The body's like a dry sponge at that point being exposed to water. And so digestive efficiency is really good and it makes it a bit easier for people to gain weight after a fasting experience, which is as it should be. You haven't affected your metabolism you haven't affected your metabolic rate. These are fixed, but you've affected digestive efficiency. Does that help, Zizi? Very, very helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Doc. Very helpful. Okay. Yes. I wouldn't personally make it a goal to eat less and less and less unless you're struggling because you're constantly overeating. And even then I'd make it a goal. I'd make it a goal to never eat until you hurt. <laughs> but, uh, but eating less and less, what you'll find out is that the, that the bathroom scale never lies. And if you consistently under eat, you will consistently lose weight. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anybody? We're open to questions. Brandon. Hey, Dr. Hi, Hi. Dr. Graham. Hi. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm really well. You? You're looking good. Um, you looking good. Are you I'm, someplace warm? I'm in Bali. Um, I'm just how south lovely. of where Alex is. Yeah. Where are you at? Right this minute, I'm in England. Oh, wow. Okay. Until tomorrow. And then, okay. I'm in, <laughs> then I'm in Serbia. Do you live um, in a warm state in America? I live in England in the southernmost oh, part, of, oh, the southernmost okay. part of England. Yeah. I, I lived you were in, in the States. Well, I lived in the Florida Keys for almost 20 years. 
I do okay. have that experience, and I and I have spent quite a few years in Costa Rica, which is okay. Pretty, which is pretty warm, except I like it up in the mountains. I love the mountains. So um, it's I have warm a, in the day, cold at night. I have a question on fasting. Yes, sir. One, what would you suggest water fasting or or even um, juice fasting? And a third question, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Let me start with a question. What would be your interest or reason for wanting to fast or to learn about fasting you're asking me that yes um might as well make it i've never i've never i've i will i've done a three-day water fast mm -hmm. i've done about 50 10-day juice fasts mm -hmm. um they always made me feel good however sure. i'm i'm hearing sometimes no don't do that from some people in the in this kind of field and people that are saying you have you not really pretty much you need to do that every once in a while and um the last fast i did was just i did watermelon for five days and that was a couple months ago um i have never done water fast and it's kind of been the topic around me lately so i don't know if if it's something i should do it's not something i feel called to do but I would definitely do it if somebody like you would uh, recommend it. Oh, bless. So that's, it's a great question. It, it could take up the rest of the hour, but I won't let it. Uh, I'm going to start at the tail end. Okay. Intermittent fasting. The, the appropriate name for intermittent fasting, I would call satiated eating. If you eat till you're satiated, then you're not going to eat again until the next meal. And when the next meal comes, if you eat till you're satiated, then you're not going to eat again until the next meal. That would be intermittent fasting. As far as I understand it, you're not eating in between meals. In order for that to happen, all you really have to do is just eat enough fruit so you're satiated from one meal till the next. Your mother was right when she said, don't eat sweets before the meal. It'll spoil your appetite, and that's exactly what happens when we eat fruit. It satiates us. It spoils our appetite, which is the whole entire point of eating, to satiate yourself for a while so that you can get on with the other wonderful things in life and do some other self-constructive stuff besides eating. Turns out all of life's necessities are pleasant experiences. They're pleasurable experiences, including eating. And I, I get a little, con little concerned when people try to take the pleasure out of eating because it's supposed to be pleasurable. The way to make it most pleasurable is sweet and juicy. Unfortunately, most people use coffee and cake as their version of sweet and juicy, or they use ice cream and ice cream and you know hot chocolate as their version of sweet and juicy or they're using even even cereal and milk as their version of sweet and juicy but for us it's fruit fruit is the best sweet and juicy ever invented i mean it's just astonishing so if i call fasting one thing but your definition of fasting is something else. We have a little bit of a hard time holding a, a meaningful conversation where we where we're, you know, getting our points across to each other. So I'm going to call fasting the extreme end or the end point of the continuum we call resting. So when you're running as fast as you can and you slow down to a jog, that, that's relatively resting compared to running as fast as you can. And when you slow down to walking, that's resting compared to jogging. And when you, when you stand still, that's resting compared to walking. 
It's a continuum from standing to sitting to laying down to letting go of your emotional stresses and concerns, to being in really comfortable surroundings, pleasant, comfortable surroundings, rather than a cold winter day sitting on the sidewalk. Sitting in nature on a warm day where the all the contours, the lines are all curved, the green is the predominant color, the sounds are the sounds of nature, this is sensory rest. So as we participate in more kinds of rest, we get deeper into the resting state. When we incorporate all four types of rest, sensory, emotional, physical, and finally, physiologic, in order to make physiologic rest happen, we basically have to shut down unnecessary systems in the body. So we shut down almost all muscular activity. This is huge physiologic rest. We shut down digestive activity. And once again, this is huge physiologic rest because the process of digestion can take, on an average, it takes 35% of the calories that a person eats every day but it can take as many as 50% of the calories a person eats immediately after mealtimes. It can take so much that you go comatose, you fall asleep after eating. That's not enough calories to stay conscious. You know, I mean, it's, it's all being demanded by the digestive. Whereas on the diet that raw vegan, high fruit-based diet, 80-10-10 style eating, We've cut digestive demands down into the teens and sometimes even less, which frees up a lot of fuel for other things. But as long as you're taking in food, the digestive system remains fully functional. And whether that food has fiber in it or not, well, fiber is good for the digestive system, I've always heard. So reducing the fiber from the digestive system, I'm not convinced that's an asset. Now, why do people feel good, as you mentioned, on a, on a juice diet? The reason is the food choice. When you're on a juice diet, your food choice is invariably fruit and or vegetable. And you don't go any further than that. Nobody makes almond juice. Nobody makes pizza juice. Toast doesn't juice well. You know, you can't, you can't juice pasta. And so all of a sudden people start eating only fruits and vegetables and they go, wow, I went on a juice diet that I felt so good. They go, yeah, because you took, you went off all the other things you were eating and went on to fruits and vegetables. You'd have done just as well if you'd only done five days on watermelon, as you mentioned, or if you'd only done five days on bananas. No fruit has any healing capacity to the body. The body does all the healing, but only when we get out of the way and supply the body with what it needs. If I give you a watermelon seed and you say, and you know, I'm going to grow a watermelon plant, well, you, you can find out what the watermelon needs. You can find out how much water, what pH, how much sunlight, what temperature, how much wind. You can find out everything a watermelon needs. If you give it everything it needs, it's going to, it's going to produce like crazy. And it's no different for human beings. If we're trying to raise a prize hog, we give it everything it needs. If we're trying to raise a prize child, we give it everything it needs. If we're trying to raise ourselves to be healthy, we supply ourselves with the needs we have. Fresh air, sunshine through the whole list. Water fasting allows you to shut the digestive system down. It's the only type of fasting that does so. Certainly intermittent fasting doesn't because it takes three to five days to even shut the digestive system down unless you have digestive problems, in which case it could take two or three weeks to shut down. Meaning water fasting is the only option for doing repairs at that point because we got to shut it down in order to do repairs. So water fasting becomes an option 
to any individual who wishes to find out what superior health is all about. If you want to see maximum athletic performance, you want to see optimum digestive powers, you want to see brain and all neural functions happening at their peak, coordination in every sense of the word from the words on the tip of your tongue to ability to think while you speak to not being accident prone to being able to move in any way that you can imagine. This type of coordination is optimized through fasting because when we water fast, all structures and all functions vector towards health. This is when the body heals itself. It's why we're told in the hospital, just rest. Because when we're at rest is when the body heals. Now we know this intuitively because every single day at the end of the day, when you're so tired that you can't do any more, you go to bed, you wake up in the morning, fully rested, having recovered all your energies, ready to go face another day and do it all over again. We know that when we're at rest, this is when our body puts itself back together. It recovers, it regains energy. And so the fasting state is an incredibly powerful state. And, and if you're the kind of person motivated to be your very best ever in human history, then, or in your history, then fasting should at least be on the cards. Right, the second might not be the time, but it's it's much like flying an airplane or climbing a Mount Everest. The likelihood of you just saying, "I'm going to go climb Mount Everest tomorrow on my own," not only is it's not likely, but it's a bad idea. You're going to die. You're going to die. And plenty of people attempt to forego the formality of having some supervision when you water fast. You want to water fast for two, three days, be my guest. You can do that on your own. Anybody can, unless they're very, very ill. But healthy people talking about a substantial water fast, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, an appropriate amount of recovery, two, three weeks of recovery time, to put that sort of an experience together should be treated like climbing Mount Everest or getting in a fighter plane for the very first time ever. You've never flown a plane of any kind. And somebody says, here, go fly this. I mean, you're going to die. It's not going to come out well. Granted, most water fasts are uneventful and they, and they go along quite well. But when they get eventful, you don't want to be in the middle of a fast needing help because there's nobody to help. You want to run a fast so well that you come out of it a different person where fasting won't affect your eating habits. But when I run a fast, I'm giving two to three hours of lecture every single day. By the time I've done 100 hours of lecture, you have enough information to make different decisions than you would have made 100 hours prior. And that information changes you to become a able to live a healthier lifestyle, to have a lot fewer questions. Um, I fasted a lot of athletics, athletes and athletic people in my life, including myself. Um, and in every single case, athletic performance went through the roof post fast, just through the roof. So, you don't have to wait until you're dying and the only option is fasting in order to think, well, maybe this would be right for me. Fasting is appropriate if you're looking to get to high levels of health because there really isn't any other route to undo or to effectively undo what your first 20 years of food probably looked like. Uh, those first 20 years, it's amazing when we lived. So I'm not a fan of intermittent fasting because, A, I think we should eat when we're hungry. We got to understand that intermittent fasting was proposed by people who are trying to lose weight or to help others lose weight. And that was the only reason that it was su suggested in the first place. Hey, you can't 
you're you're obese and it's getting worse every year. Try this pattern of eating. Try some pattern to your eating. You know, so here's a pattern you could try. Don't eat within three hours of bed. Don't eat within three hours of waking up. Well, what if you wake up in the morning and you do your heavy workout as soon as you wake up? If you want to recover from that workout, you need to eat or you're delaying your recovery substantially. So to wait because you're trying to do intermittent fasting makes no sense whatsoever. You should eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired, drink when you're thirsty. Imposing, um, imposing rules that have no real basis. I mean, I don't see any other animal intentionally doing that. There's no model in nature for such behavior. You you would you don't do intermittent drinking. Oh, I'm only going to drink. Well, I'm not going to drink when I'm thirsty. I'm not going to let that clue tell me anything. I'm going to only drink at certain times. Or I'm only going to sleep at certain times. I don't care if I'm tired. I'm not going to sleep. You know, I mean, this. why would we do that with food? This is twisted. Yeah, and, and do quick one on that topic. Um, so you talked about animals, especially, and intermittent fasting. I haven't dived enough to know exactly, but um, the, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of studies where, for example, they had mice and they did an A-B test and some were doing forced to do intermittent fasting and the others not. And often the studies, they say the mice that were forced intermittent fasting actually lived much longer. What do you think of that? Yeah. And the studies have been done on people too. And what we find, they're, they're, the studies are done by insurance companies. They're called actuarial tables. And where the results are called actuar actuarial tables. And what we find is that the fatter you are, the shorter you live. Absolutely. There's... There's old people and there's fat people and there's no old fat people. There's no 500 pound centenarians. That doesn't exist, right? It just doesn't happen. There's no 250 kilo centenarians. Doesn't exist. The fatter you are, the shorter you live. But it doesn't mean that the skinnier, skinnier you are, the longer you live. That's also not true. And typically, exceptionally skinny people don't live longer or even as long. And for a good while, insurance companies would, would say that if you were too thin, that worked against you in terms of longevity. I'm not saying that. What... The way the information is presented often slants the view of how we understand the information. If you and I are in a running race and you beat me, you can tell people, I beat Doug Graham in a running race. I can say, I was in a running race and out of everybody there, I took second. And Alex came in next to last. It sounds completely different. It's true. I, it sounds like I beat you. You came in next to last. Oh, it happened to be first, but you were next to last. Right. So how we present it definitely affects the way that we understand it. Uh, as the saying goes, there's liars, damn liars and statisticians. So when this information about intermittent fasting, about eating less, when this is presented, they are not talking to thin people. They're talking to fat people. We have to understand that obesity is, is almost half the population. Overweight is about three quarters of the population. Now, when we talk about eating less, this cannot be sustained. You can't just eat less and less and less and less. As you weigh less, you need less, which would mean you'd have to eat even less for it to be 
too little. But just like driving your car, if you're putting in less fuel than you need on a daily basis, you're going to run out of fuel. You're going to start using bodily reserves, which is fine for a fat person. It's the goal. There's no old fat people. There's no old fat rats or mice or whoever they were studying. But if we start with a bunch of trim people and then cut back on their food by limiting when they're allowed to eat it, bad things happen. You start getting thinner and thinner and thinner. You start eating your own muscle mass for fuel. You start starving. Starvation is not a parameter that we associate with longevity. So, so for sure, fat people need to lose weight and they will do better. They will live longer because of it. So will fat mice live longer if we can trim them down. But only down to acceptable, normal, healthy levels which I defined in 80, 10, 10, what, you know, single digits for men, teens for women. We're pretty well done on the body fat discussion. After that, it's just people playing with numbers to try to prove a point or sell a program because it's a con game at that point. Thinner, thinner, thinner. I mean, you can get too thin. There's plenty of people come to me because Everybody tells them they're too thin and they don't want to be that thin or they're so thin they can't, they don't even like it themselves. It's too thin. If I tell that person, well, try intermittent fasting, you could lose some more weight. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. Would you say a good natural time to fast is like when you're sick, when you like need the rest? Like they do that in nature, right? Like animals. Yeah. Animals go off their feed is what we say. They're off their feed. You know, something's wrong because they're not eating. And I would say anytime you don't feel like yourself, whether that's because you have a fever or because you're ultra tired, or you're emotionally unpoised, really upset, um, you're you're actually hurt, sick, um, stressed out of your mind. These are these might be good times to just like calm down. Okay, anytime you don't feel like yourself, but sometimes we arbitrarily begin fasting. We say, ah, like I run events. I run fasting events, a whole retreat where everybody comes and fasts and then everybody recovers together. Each is on their own individual path and they start and stop on their own individual time set. But basically they're in a group and they're all fasting together and there's mutual support. And that's a wonderful thing. All these people start at about the same time, within a day or two of the same time. And that's an arbitrary beginning to the fast. And, and some of them are so ill and they're fasting for a specific reason to overcome a specific condition. But some of them are world-class athletes or very healthy people who are enthusiastic about becoming more healthy. And for those people... Although we look at all the parameters we possibly can, there is nonetheless a degree of arbitrary ending to the fast. There's reasons why this would be a good day or this might not be a good day based on how you're doing at any given time, but it's sort of arbitrary within, within some parameters. So... Yes to your question, but there are other times to fast besides just then. That said, my life goal in this in this discipline would be I want to I want to live in such a fashion that fasting is almost never required. Cuz cuz at least to some degree fasting is a penalty not 
the price, you know, not the prize itself. I'm not looking to live my life fasting. I did a long fast. I did a 30 day fast. Uh, I've done four 14 day fasts. I've done a whole bunch of seven to 10 day fasts. But anytime I can live my life in such a fashion that fasting is not required, I'm perfectly happy not to be fasting because I love living my life. I love being active. I love going out and doing stuff. I like, I enjoy, I enjoy my food as well. I don't live in order to eat, but I certainly enjoy eating and that whole thing. I'm not looking to, to fast every Monday because it's some penalty that I have to pay. I, I would never do that. I don't recommend that. Um, I would rather, I'd rather see if you're going to fast, let's do it right. If you're not going to bother fasting, fine. Okay, Dylan. Hi, Doug. Pleasure to speak to you. <laughs> Lovely to hear your voice. Uh, whereabouts in England are you? I'm on the South Downs. Um, if I look out my window, I see a town called Amberley. I'm in a town called Pulborough. Uh, I'm as far south as you can get, just to the west of Brighton. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, Bright Brighton's lovely. Um, I just wanted to, just on the last point that you touched on, um, what does a day in the life of doug look like so obviously it's going to vary my life? yeah what does a typical day look like do you have quite strict eating windows or are you more intuitive i'm just quite fascinated to get a little insight i'm not that regimented i don't think but within that maybe that's just me because i've learned to live with my own regimentation <laughs> um and my a day in the life has changed quite a bit. A day in my life today isn't necessarily what it always was like. It has changed over time. Uh, but at this point, I get up and get busy with clients, which is usually either a a WhatsApp call or some email or a Zoom conversation, something with client, interactive with clients. And I'll I'll see three, four, five, six clients in the morning um, or answer their emails at, at some depth. Depends on how I'm communicating with any given client at any time. But I wake up and I get some work done. Um, once that happens... <sighs> I'll usually be at least some active, a little active, maybe some gardening, raking. Raking's really active for me. That's like, ooh, go after it. I love the intensity of just like, boom, 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 get myself good and out of breath and, and do a little raking. It's autumn. So, I mean, everything's falling off the trees right now. We have an oak tree in our garden. We have a bear tree. They're both just dropping like there's no tomorrow. So a lot of raking is happening. Uh, I'm picking um, it's harvest still, so I'm picking blueberries and grapes and the last of the figs and apples and pears and picking all that. Uh, and I make dinner for my family. So depending on how I'm going to go about that on any given day, uh, usually there's still some morning to at least decide what's going to be dinner today and start on that even if it just means pulling veggies out of the fridge or sorting through tomatoes until I know which ones I'm going to, you know, get everything out and ready. I'm going to do another round of clients. I'm going to take the dogs for a walk. I'm going to at least three or four times a week, I'm going to do some lifting. Um, about 13 or 14 years ago, I discovered lifting. I, obviously I was introduced to it as a kid, but I never enjoyed it and nobody really showed me the benefits. And I always did all my strength training using my own body weight, like a gymnast would. Uh, and then I met a guy and he said, come try this. And I, I was friends with him anyway. So I said, sure, I'll try. And lo and behold, it's not that I like lifting so much, 
but I love the technical challenge of lifting well to get lifts really identical as the last one and to and to get the mechanics exactly correct so that I'm lifting to the ability of my strength rather than the limits of my technique. Uh, I love the challenge of that. So I'm, I'm lifting, I'm training at the moment for national championships, uh, which I full well intend to be on the podium. It would be nice to be at the top of the podium, but I'm not making predictions. Uh, but I certainly intend to train as though I, I'm going to be on the podium uh, at nationals in June. So I'm training for that at the moment, and it keeps me a bit motivated to keep going out there and do something. Uh, uh, it's a real treat. My my wife is homeschooling my daughter, and they have ponies as well. So they're off at the ponies a lot, taking care of them and putting time into them. Uh, and one of the nicest things I can do for them is to make them dinner. So I'm going to make drinks. I'm going to make fruit cocktail. I'm going to make burgers or something like it. I'm going to make salad. I'm going to make food and keep it interesting every night uh, so that they can enjoy. They'll come home from ponies and, and have a nice dinner. I don't spend a lot of social time, although enough to communicate with friends. Uh, I don't do any social media. I was I was actually thinking yesterday that it's been several years since I can even remember turning a television on for anything. Um, and the last thing I think I turned it on for was was Olympics. So that was quite some time ago. Um, that's one of the beauties of of British television is they you can watch the Olympics with no commercials. So I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to watch Wimbledon, although I missed it completely this year. Um, I'm involved in a ton of fruit festivals. I'm a public speaker. I go to a ton of events. And a lot of those events, the organizer asked me to help with the organization of the event, how to make it more effective, more efficient, better in any way, glean my experience. So I do spend a fair bit of time um, helping the organizers organize and then attending the events. I've got, I'm going tomorrow to Serbian Fruit Fest, for instance, and I'm gone. I'm, I'm, I'm away from home about three months a year. So a typical day almost doesn't exist, but there will be dinner with family. We, we attempt to have dinner with family um, most nights. But Rosie's also a public speaker, and a lot of times her public speaking happens from right here, uh, Zoom, and either she's busy for dinner or I'm busy doing something like this while they're. It's a mess at the moment, really. I don't have a, I don't have a a good pattern that I can say. Oh, I do this. I do this. I, I remember there was times in life where it was very regimented. I much more go with the flow. I make my I make my clients a priority. I make my family a priority. I make my clients a priority. And I make taking my dog out for a walk just before bed. So last night it was, we didn't even get out until after midnight. But if she hears me putting on a coat or putting on shoes, she comes running. And then yeah, we go. Yeah, it's the same here. You know, and then we go for a walk. So I like the late night walk. I really enjoy that. Uh, I'm having a ton of fun being useful, being productive. Uh, I'm I'm learning a whole bunch of things all at the same time. I, I make a little time every day to work on Spanish. I'd like to keep learning to court to converse in Spanish a little better than I can. Um, while at the same time, I'm also learning as many other things as I can. I, I I want to remain productive. This is a it's hard for young people to understand how what a gift it is to be able to be useful and productive, to be a necessary part of society um, for as long as I can. I, I don't want to become you know oh get out of the way, Doug. You're just really old and in the way. I'm not looking for that to happen yet. And so 
I I really appreciate this opportunity and and opportunities like this. Mm. I used to be a cardio guy and I put more time into exercise than I do now. My exercise needs don't require as much time as they used to because I'm more strength oriented. It doesn't take as much time, but I still like to be able to hop on my bicycle and ride a few miles. Uh, I still enjoy being able to do whatever's necessary, move rocks in the garden or whatever is necessary. Rosie bought a couple of tons of rocks and said, I'm building a rock garden. I go, you are? She goes, yes. Could you move the rocks, please? From where they got delivered to where I want them. So I go, sure, I'll pick up rocks and walk with them. <laughs> and it's nice to be able to do that. The gutters needed cleaning. So I got in a ladder. I climb up to the roof of the house, clean the gutters. Um, and I'm thinking, gosh, I wonder how many more years I'll be doing this for. <laughs> But at the moment, going up there was really no big deal. Um, yesterday, we had a tree needed pruning. So I go up and prune the tree. And, and I, it's fun to be able to be functional. Am I a little more careful? Am I a little less agile? Conceivably, yes to both of those. I, 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 I actually think I'm a little more aware that I don't want to make an error. I don't, th I don't think I'm less agile or more careful. I'm just a little more aware that I don't want to make an error because <laughs> I don't want to get hurt. Getting hurt's terrible. I hate getting hurt. I hate getting sick. So uh, I love that in the last, gosh, in the last 40 something years, I've basically not been sick. Um, well, I've had a couple of, I've had a day here and there, but nothing, nothing big, you know, no, no surgeries, no hospitalizations, no, just keep going. No, no colds. I mean, that just doesn't happen. It's my daughter asked me the other day, actually, she said, how come you never get a cold? <laughs> <You know? laughs> the only answer I had for her was because I've already had them all. <laughs> But not in the last, when I discovered um, really high level health and and raw foods and, and I remember I was so sick on December 15th, 1980. I was so sick that day. It was terrible. And I don't want to have another sick day to be quite honest. So I, I, I get enough sleep to feel like I've woke up ready to start again, which isn't that much sleep. My father never slept much and neither do I. But if I'm with a group of people, I'm usually the last one asleep and the first one awake. But that's always been normal for me. So a uh, day in the life is me being as productive as I can. Yeah, that resonates deeply. Um, just quickly, don't want to steal too much of your time but in terms of like obviously you've been raw for decades now but have you noticed a change in energy and like habits obviously certain habits but i'm just going to give a bit of context so for me personally with this online age this information age i acknowledge that if you want to push out a certain message you need an online presence but i struggle i have like this inner conflict with using technology like, I feel like I have a a certain, there's something that's, there's a bit of conflict whenever I use technology. So I'm just wondering, how do you juggle that? Like when you're sitting down with your clients, how do you, how do you kind of justify it? Or how do you, because I, I've found since going raw, I can't sit still for that long. I'm kind of like itching to get up. I'm full of energy. I want a more outdoor lifestyle. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I so sunbathe how, how outside and that? talk to my clients while I'm sunbathing. Yeah. I've done that. Um, and they're happy that I'm getting outside, in fact. I mean, I, I care yeah. for them, but they care for me too. Uh, and it's a good question. I grew up in a – in a. my dad was on computers before I was born. He worked on computers his whole life and my whole life. I saw him 
I mean, I remember computers were normal for me. He had a home computer when I was a teenager, back when, you know, a home computer cost $28,000 American, which was a whole lot of money back in, in 1968. You know, I mean, it's a big deal, but, but he always had a, he always had a computer in the house and, and always he'd work on it all night long and, and still have his day job. Uh, so for me, being on technology doesn't bother me, but social media, I don't want to do it at all. And I use, um, I, I use and am using a technique, uh, uh, you know, I'm doing a program with Ted Carr uh, where we're we're coaching people to become 80-10-10 coaches. And one of the pieces of information that he gave that I implemented right away was if some part of your job seems like work, hire somebody else to do it. So I do. I hire other people to do the parts of my job that I don't want to do so that I can honestly look you in the eye and say, I love every bit of my work. I love my work. It doesn't seem like work. I'm having a blast doing this. And I'm going to have a blast right now as I run to my two o'clock meeting um, and meet with the next person because I love what I do. And if that means a little bit of Zoom conversation, so be it. Uh, it's really... It's really valuable in their life, which makes it really valuable in my life. Uh, and I, my, my college, my, my, when I went through my medical training, my chiropractic college had a motto to give, to love, to serve with some commas. And I added to do at the end of that. So to give, to love, to serve to do this these four phrases are really really important to me i love every bit of that uh, i hope you guys found some value in this uh, if you need me back i'll come back and today i'm going to run just because i want to be on time for the next person but thank you also very much hopefully we'll put a link down the bottom of where people can find me and guys i'd love to hear from you again i invite you to reach out to me anytime email me anytime you want uh, I'll be happy to communicate more if you think of other things you wanted to ask. Thank you, Thanks Doug. Thank you so much. Alex. Thank Thanks, you. Doug. Really appreciate right. your time. I'm going to run. Thank you so much, Doug. And thank you so much for the people who listened also. I will uh, stop the recording now, but we can stay for to have a little community chat for the people watching on, on YouTube or listening. Uh, if you want to support, you can subscribe, like, and share. And of course, if you want to join the community and also ask your questions to a special guest. I'll also put a link in the description below. Thank you.